All right, so again, welcome everybody. So this is a 55th Flow Talk where Flow stands for Federated Learning One World Seminar that was created to provide a global online forum for the dissemination of the latest scientific research results in all aspects of federated learning. This includes distributed optimization, learning algorithms, privacy, cryptography, personalization, communication, compression, systems, hardware, and many more. So uh, before we start, a few technicalities. This talk is recorded and going to be posted afterwards to our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, uh, there are two options how you can ask. Either post your question to the chat and set visibility, visibility to everybody, or just raise your hand in the, that's available through the participants menu, and I'll try to unmute you. So today, it's my great pleasure to introduce you our speaker, Brian Pullins who is a research assistant professor at Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago. And his research interest lies in the intersection of optimization and machine learning, both in theory and practice. And he receives his PhD of, uh, in computer science from Princeton University. And this year he won the best paper award at COD. And today he's gonna tell us a bit about a stochastic Newton algorithm for distributed convex optimization. So please, Brian, stage is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much for the uh, very kind introduction, Samuel. And um, I mentioned this earlier, but I just want to note that um, I'm feeling a, a little bit under the weather. So if I have to take a moment, so please bear with me. And I, I apologize in advance. And as Samuel mentioned, I am more than happy to take uh, any questions um, as they come up. So um, this is joint work uh, with Kumar Shichich Patel, uh, Ohad Shamir, uh, Nazi Srebro and Blake Woodworth. So to kind of set the stage for optimization in modern machine learning, what um, many of us are familiar with nowadays is that these modern uh, machine learning models have millions of both examples and millions of parameters. So you know, we've gone from uh, instances of you know, things like MNIST, which had tens of thousands of examples, uh, to now having ImageNet, uh, with millions uh, of, uh, of examples, and a similar uh, increase has happened in the, the models. So we've gone from uh, some really shallow uh, neural networks uh, to very, very deep, uh, fully connected uh, networks. And in fact, even more recently, um, we now see instances of uh, um, models with billions of parameters. So a, a great example of this is the recent GPT-3 model uh, which has something on the order of you know 175 billion parameters, right? So these models are huge. These data sets are huge, and um, for training these models, as many of us are familiar with, uh, stochastic gradient descent is sort of the workhorse uh, in this setting. It's it's a really powerful uh, and very general technique, and it has variants um, that are useful in different settings and whatnot. So this is uh, kind of key to um, making all of this all this work. But with this um, huge uh, um, increase in the size of these models, um, I hope to argue that distributed optimization is another facet to handling this increasing complexity. And uh, this sort of approach uh, you know, now, as we know, plays a really crucial part. So I first want to give a sort of a uh, quick overview of the contributions and then uh, to sort of set the stage for, for where the talk will be going. And then we can sort of dive in a bit more deeply into um, all the, the more nuanced context. Uh, so in this work, we present a distributed Newton method, which uh, not only does it rely on a stochastic first order oracle, but it will also require a stochastic Hessian vector product oracle. And uh, what's more, as we'll explain later, that um, it's very computationally efficient, that this can be done about as efficiently as the stochastic crystal oracle. Um, our method, as we'll see, in fact, can improve upon uh, uh, related first order uh, stochastic methods, including a local SGD and FedAct for uh, under the appropriate smoothness assumptions and in some regimes of parameters. And we also see empirically that our method performs well when compared to baselines, and particularly in the uh, sparse communication regime. 
And uh, more specifically, our method is uh, one we call FEDESIN or Federated Stochastic Newton. The main idea is to sort of approximately solve a constrained quadratic step problem at each step. Uh, in a spirit similar to that of the trust region method. And we then show how the constrained problem can be further broken down into a sequence of some unconstrained quadratic problems. And the final key component um, is that for each of these uh, unconstrained subproblems, we're going to rely on local SGD with a single round of communication, also known as uh, uh, one-shot averaging. And uh, as we'll see, this is sort of a perfectly suited method to this uh, problem of an unconstrained quadratic. So to outline the talk, uh, first I want to give uh, some background on the uh, homogeneous distributed convex optimization setting. We'll then move on to local SGD, and we'll see the min-max complexity in the uh, smooth stochastic weakly convex uh, distributed setting and the in with uh, intermittent communication. Uh, this will lead us to um, sort of a, a deeper overview of our federated stochastic Newton or FedSN method. Um, and we'll see how that all sort of works by going beyond first order smoothness and beyond stochastic gradients. And uh, finally, we'll end with uh, our more practical variants, which we call FEDIS and LIGHT, and uh, the uh, empirical uh, performance alongside it. So the basic optimization setup that we work in is we consider an unconstrained stochastic minimization problem. So that is, we want to minimize some uh, f of x for x and rd um, that's expressed as an expectation over some uh, uh, z's drawn from a distribution, you can think of it as data, uh, but just more generally as some, some z's drawn from distribution of uh, some functions that are a function of uh, both x and, and z. And you know, what do we know about this uh, function f, right? Is it convex, is it non-convex, maybe smooth, maybe non-smooth, right? All of these considerations will affect um, what sorts of guarantees we might hope to achieve. And so in this talk, we will focus on the smooth and the convex setting. So smooth convex optimization. Now, we also want to uh, uh, establish some uh, baseline assum uh, assumptions for uh, our setting. So throughout, throughout, we will assume that F is H smooth. Uh, that is, uh, that the gradient of F is Lipschitz continuous. We will assume that uh, the minimizer uh, X star is uh, bounded in norm by uh, some scalar B. And we will also assume uh, a uniformly bounded gradient uh, variant. Um, so, and all of these are quite standard assumptions in the uh, setting of uh, sort of stochastic uh, optimization. Now, for the distributed uh, setting with intermittent communication, right? The idea is that we, we consider a setup of some M machines, which after K iterations, and for these K iterations, uh, some operation will, will be performed generally you know, uh, um, we might think of those iterations as being um, uh, stochastic uh, gradient computations. But um, as we'll see, right, there might be some more general um, uh, uh, computational model that we might consider for, for to take place in uh, these K iterations. And then after these K iterations, we want to communicate across the machines. And uh, we will continue to do this uh, uh, R time, so R rounds of communication total. And with these K iterations per, uh, uh, between rounds and the R rounds total, this leads to a total parallel runtime of K times R. In addition, so some other setting details that are uh, very important to point out. In this work, we work in the homogeneous distributed setting. 
So that means that each machine may access the same data distribution. And this is Sorry, in Brian. contrast. Yes. Yeah, there is one question from audience, just a clarification question, so I can read it out for you. Uh, do we assume minimizer is attained and it is unique? Um, we we do we do need to assume that um, uh, there is a minimizer, and um, but I don't believe that uniqueness uh, is is required. Thank you. So back to the uh, homogeneous setting versus the heterogeneous setting. Uh, where each machine uh, has access to a different uh, data distribution. And uh, while we don't consider uh, this uh, setting in our work, it has also gained a, a lot of interest uh, recently. And it's particularly relevant to um, some settings of federated learning where in fact, you know, each machine uh, we do assume um, has access uh, to uh, a different uh, data distribution. Uh, furthermore, we work in the stochastic or the uh, also sometimes known as the one pass or streaming setting. And this is in contrast to the batch or ERM setting, which considers uh, problems of a uh, finite sum form. So one method that is very popular in this area is what's known as local SGD. Here, for a given machine, each iteration is a step of SGD with respect to its local parameters. So you know, we can consider one machine M and we have, um, X uh, M not, so this is maybe the, the first iteration uh, along this uh, single strand of SGD. And then we consider again on the same machine, uh, X M one, which is given as a gradient step opposite, opposite um, the, the gradients uh, at X M zero. So it gives X M one. And uh, then we take another step and go to XM2 and so on. And this amounts to uh, capital M parallel runs of SGD. Give me one second, I apologize. So we have uh, M parallel runs of SGD. And uh, at the end of each round, we will communicate and average these M parallel runs. And then each parallel SGD run will begin again from this average point. Now, there are some drawbacks uh, to this method. Um, specifically, uh, and quite unfortunately, right, it can be bad in general, uh, and, and furthermore, it's not even uh, always better than the following naive method, right? So consider a method uh, where on each of the M machines, uh, you calculate um, one stochastic gradient on the first uh, iteration, and for the following K minus one iterations, you just do nothing. You just kind of, you know, bide your time or twiddle your thumbs, right? Uh, and at the end, average those M stochastic gradients and uh, use that as your update. Turns out uh, that averaged uh, uh, them averages your update. It turns out that that even can be better than local SGD in some settings. 
However, there are benefits to the method. Um, and most notably for quadratic problems, local SGD is at least as good as mini batch SGD. And what's more, a, an accelerated variance of local SGD achieves the min max complexity rate. Um, so it's, it's uh, min max optimal. And what's more, even one shot averaging, so that is you know, local SGD for just one round of communication is perfectly suited to uh, quadratics. And um, this will sort of play an important role in the sorts of uh, guarantees that we hope for and the approach that we take. Um, a little bit more on uh, uh, min-max complexity, uh, 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 not in terms of um, uh, quadratics, but sort of a little bit more generally. Uh, there's been, uh, our recent work has shown um, uh, the, how, you know, the, has established the min-max complexity up to some log factors for smooth stochastic convex distributed optimization in the in intermittent communication setting. And the idea is that um, by running both uh, mini batch accelerated SGD and single machine accelerated SGD, uh, if you were to return the better uh, results uh, given by these two, that that is um, sort of up to log factors, um, min max uh, optimal. And um, so note that here, we specifically uh, have shown um, this uh, lower bound for um, smooth, uh, uh, for first order smooth stochastic convex uh, optimization. So maybe there, if we wanted to sort of go beyond this, right, we have sort of two general approaches. Uh, one is we could consider a more restricted function class. This is kind of what we saw in the case of the better min max complexity for quadratics. And uh, the other might be to introduce some additional Oracle access. And in fact, in this work, we sort of look at both approaches to uh, improve. So uh, in terms of going beyond uh, first order methods, um, Newton's method is sort of a very natural starting point, right? Where uh, the idea is to take the gradient and sort of rescale and redirect it by the inverse of the Hessian. And um, an advantage of this method, at least um, in sort of the general, um, particularly the deterministic uh, Newton uh, method setting, is that it converges really rapidly uh, under the appropriate assumptions. Um, so um, you will get, if you're close enough to the minimizer, you'll get some log log rate of convergence. And, um, and these, um, you know, this is well founded, but um, the main issue with the methods is uh, that it's really expensive to compute and then furthermore invert the Hessian. And this becomes especially uh, uh, um, uh, difficult in the case of a stochastic or a population loss as we consider in, in our setting. So one thing we might ask is, is there a, a different uh, parallel way particularly in this um, stochastic setting. So uh, as an alternative view of Newton's method, right, we can, each, we, can, we can view each step as being equivalent to minimizing some local uh, quadratic approximation. So here we're saying that uh, xt plus one is updated as the argmin of a quadratic model centered around um, xt. And uh, so, you know, we've already sort of uh, um, told of the benefits of local SGD for quadratic problems. And now we have some sub problem that is a quadratic and we might ask, well, can we take advantage of our, um, of the benefits of local SGD on this particular quadratic sub problem? Um, An important thing to note, however, is that the gradient of, of this quadratic sub problem looks like um, some Hessian uh, uh, of f times x minus xt plus some uh, gradients uh, of f and the Hessian and the gradients being at uh, xt. And so if we want to 
to, to be able to run local SGD on the quadratic would require having some stochastic gradient access to the gradients uh, of this quadratic. And um, that, as we see here, sort of not only involves um, the stochastic, not only involves the uh, gradient information or what we would use as sort of stochastic gradient information, but also this Hessian uh, information in the form of a Hessian vector product. And so we'll want to introduce some extra Oracle access that will let us um, uh, uh, get estimates of uh, this gradient. So in terms of a different Oracle model, right? We've already seen uh, our standard stochastic gradient Oracle, um, which is that we have um, that there's an oracle system that we can access to get an unbiased uh, estimator of the gradient and which has bounded variance which is bounded by like sigma squared and um so then suppose we also wanted to consider a different uh, oracle access and this one is sort of with respect to uh, two query points so we would query both uh, with respect to um, some x as kind of like the point where we might want to take um, our uh, uh, get our Hessian, and also a, a query with respect to some v, which is the vector as part of our Hessian vector product. So specifically, this oracle uh, queried at x and v will return an unbiased estimator of the Hessian of f at x times the vector v. And furthermore, um, we will uh, um, require a bound on the variant. Of this estimator. And um, note that um, it, it's important to have um, the, 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 the bound on the variance be dependent on the norm squared of the vector uh, B. Now, that is sort of is the kind of extra Oracle access we might consider. And in terms of a different function class, uh, I want to move a little bit to the condition of quasi self importance. So there's been a lot of recent interest in um, the condition of uh, beta quasi self importance. Um, and the condition looks a little bit like normal self importance. But the important difference is that rather than having um, the Hessian term to the three halves power on the right hand side, we have uh, a Hessian sort of a Hessian norm term times a, an L2 norm in this um, uh, third uh, um, variable H. And um, the, the, the details or why this um, is so helpful isn't quite as important. I mean, the main idea is that by controlling the third derivative in terms of the second derivative this way, you can um, have some control over the Hessian, that the Hessian has some sort of stability property. Um, um, but um, as we'll see, it, it's sort of a, a bit of a black box uh, useful um, consideration uh, uh, because um, it will allow us to optimize, to, to break down uh, uh, these QSC functions, uh, uh, these QSC optimization problems into a sequence of constrained quadratic problems. Now, uh, um, this is an important um, uh, um, function class to consider because it includes, among others, uh, logistic regression, uh, softmax, and uh, regularized LP regression. And um, it allows for um, fast convergence, as I just mentioned, um, via a uh, sequence of uh, constrained quadratic problems. Give me one second, sorry. So this sort of leads us to a recap of um, our FEDESIN method. The main idea is uh, each iteration will approximately can solve a constrained quadratic subproblem. And it's like a trust region method. 
um, that we will break further down into some unconstrained quadratic problems. Now, for each of these unconstrained quadratic problems, uh, uh, we will use local SGD with a single round of communication, also known as one shot averaging. And uh, here's what I was sort of omitting earlier, but I will um, uh, uh, get into a little bit more now, is one of the key technical difficulties, arguably the technical difficulty, is um, when reducing um, the constrained problem to a sequence of unconstrained problems, um, the standard approach is to sort of look for some ideal regularization parameter, lambda star, and uh, one would want to solve, if you had access to this lambda star, you would want to solve um, the uh, regularized uh, quadratic subproblem um, given by this lambda star. But unfortunately, we don't know what this lambda star is a priori. And furthermore, um, one technique that's standard defined it is some sort of binary search uh, uh, until you get close enough to the right lambda star based on some, some conditions that you can check. But in our case, we only have access to stochastic gradients and stochastic Hessian vector products, in addition to only approximately solving sort of expectation, uh, each of the sub problems. And um, all of this uh, introduces um, uh, some additional error into our guess of the correct lambda star that we have to account for. Um, here, sort of, uh, for those uh, interested in seeing the pseudocode, basically this sort of recaps what I have just said. So again, here we see we have some input, we have uh, some hyperparameters, including the number of iterations. It's almost, but not quite, uh, like the number of rounds of communication. That's a subtlety that I is not worth getting into, um, but we could take that offline or I can point to it in the paper. Uh, but the main uh, crux of the pseudocode, the main interesting thing related to what I just mentioned is to having um, some set of regularization parameters um, for which we try one, um, we uh, uh, define a regularized quadratic subproblem with respect to this uh, lambda. Uh, we then run uh, SGD uh, on uh, this model uh, independently on our machines for the case steps and communicate um, uh, the final um, iterates. And, and again, note that this is the, the true function model for which we want to sort of use our Oracle access, query our, our Oracles to get the gradients of, of this um, uh, regularized quadratic uh, local model. Um, and then we say, if we, based on a bunch of conditions being checked, if our lambda is good enough, then we update our step and, um, uh, or we uh, assign it to our step and we take it. Otherwise, we reduce the size of our lambda set uh, by half, as is typical for binary search. Um, so a sort of um, pictorially, what we see is, you know, here we have our regularized model for some uh, uh, lambda bar, some guess, right? And um, we say, okay, uh, we've started at um, X uh, on our machine, zeroth iterates, and um, an X uh, uh, sub TR star will be the true constrained minimizer. So, right, this is equivalent to this sort of Q zero where, where, where the, the lambda term would be zero, right? So in this case, it looks like our the minimizer of our quadratic sort of overshoots uh, the the ground truth the xtr star that we would like, and so in that case, right, our lambda uh, bar is um, less than uh, the lambda star, so we need to adjust. Similarly, right, we might have something that is that undershoots uh, the true um, xtr uh, star. Uh, maybe lambda bar is too big. And then maybe we keep trying and trying and trying, and we finally find uh, some lambda bar that's pretty close to lambda star. Um, and we then take our step and we update there and we continue. Now, there is a, an important uh, caveat here 
which is, I alluded to earlier, which is that um, several technical difficulties are missing from this view. Um, namely that we can only approximately solve each of our um, uh, unconstrained uh, quadratic models. And this is based on um, stochastic estimates. So um, there are some extra uh, um, loops and a little bit more, um, some, some um, a few more things that we do to sort of hone in on the uh, correct step. Now, um, an important thing to ask here is, so we've, we know that stochastic gradients can be efficiently computed for, um, um, for these problems, right? This is kind of why stochastic gradient descent is the workhorse in modern machine learning. But, um, you know, why should we expect these Hessian vector products to be computed efficiently, especially because, you know, the Hessian in general is some uh, D by D object. And so it seems kind of crazy that you could get a, a, um, um, away with um, using the Hessian um, without requiring some D squared time per operation. But in fact, it turns out that for the case of uh, generalized linear models, which includes uh, logistic regression, um, these stochastic Hessian vector products can actually be computed in time proportional to that of computing a stochastic gradient. Um, so um, the way to see this is that you know, for a given example, um, especially particularly when, when in, if, if one does think in, in terms of, for the moment, uh, in, in terms of um, like a, um, a, a finite sum setting, right? Like where one has a rank one Hessian, um, it's um, just a matter of taking an inner product first and then multiplying it by um, a vector. And thus one never actually had to see the whole, uh, the whole Hessian. And it turns out that this sort of advantage of, of being able to compute Hessian vector products in time about the same as that of stochastic gradients is um, not limited to generalized linear models, but in fact can be extended to uh, to neural networks. Um, this was uh, sort of shown by Perlmutter. And the idea there is that one can uh, simply do a second back propagation through the network. And uh, that, will, um, that will be enough to get a uh, Torsona Hessian vector product. So this all brings us to our uh, main theorem, uh, informally stated which says, um, so we suppose that F is convex, H smooth, and quasi self-concordance. We have uh, uh, the minimizer is bounded in norm, and we're assuming access to both types of oracles. So both um, stochastic gradient and stochastic hashtag product. Then what we find is that um, our expected error is uh, bounded by uh, some terms that sort of decay uh, exponentially, as long as k and r are chosen uh, large enough, um, plus um, sort of an optimization term and uh, some um, variance-based terms. So one term based on the uh, based on sigma and another term based on a rho. So a little bit hard to um, perfectly put this in context, particularly because there are a lot of parameters here and they all uh, interact in different ways. Um, so here I wanted to uh, sort of include um, a comparison all, with all of the parameters explicitly stated for uh, these um, previous uh, methods um, under various um, smoothest assumptions. Um, and um, it's a, again, it's a little bit hard to see how these compare or why this method might be better, why it might be worse. So instead, um, uh, uh, and again, it's also what makes it difficult to compare, particularly with FedEx, is uh, differences in the assumptions. There is a different oracle access. Um, so we have an extra oracle access. 
And we are also considering uh, quasi self concordance instead of a third order smoothness. Excuse me one second. So let's try to find a way to more easily uh, establish a comparison between these methods. Uh, in particular, we're going to consider a natural scaling for objectives of the form some expectation uh, over z of some loss of some inner product of x and z, where the derivatives of uh, L are uh, bounded by constant, and where we let uh, the norm of the data be bounded by d. We know we can know that this holds for logistic regression. This then leads to a natural parameter setting, where these parameters can be expressed in terms of uh, d, various um, powers of d. Now, what we find in this setting by plugging in all of these values is that FedEx um, is bounded by uh, one term uh, in terms of like this would be squared over kr squared plus um, uh, d to the five thirds, b to the five thirds over k to the third, r to the fourth. And FedSN is bounded by some d squared b squared over root k over or root k times r. And what we can see is that when r is uh, less than um, root k over db, uh, that is when there's less communication for db not too large, um, our method uh, FedSN can improve upon FedAx. It's also important to compare with some first order lower bounds in this setting. In particular, uh, lower bounds have also been shown uh, in our work under not only sort of normal smoothness as we mentioned earlier, but also under quasi self concordance. So in this same natural parameter setting, we have the following lower bounds for uh, quasi self concordance. And so we find that in the case that uh, if db were O of one, and when r is small, so for a few rounds of communication, fed, N, fed Sn achieves something like a bound of one over root k up to log factors. And in this important machine, fed Sn actually matches the lower bounds, though admittedly with a stronger oracle, and up to log factors.
my apologies. Give me just one minute. Great. So as I was saying, <clears throat> in this very important uh, regime of parameters, uh, Fedesin matches um, the lower bound, though <clears throat> um, with, uh, so the, the, the catch here, right, is that um, these first order lower bounds are in, in, in fact first order, right? So, um, and we're able to match uh, this lower bound, but with a strong oracle with this uh, stochastic um, hash effect product oracle. But I would note uh, that, um, in, in fact, we don't uh, know of any um, other stochastic methods, in particular stochastic first order methods, um, that match uh, this lower bound in the uh, quasi self concordant uh, setting. Though, um, as I I I'll allude to earlier, to, to uh, later, um, this provides some uh, interesting directions for uh, future work. Um, now uh, we get to see some uh, empirical results for our method uh, Fedesin uh, light. Um, and um, so here, our parallel runtime is t equals uh, 100. So that's, uh, if we, we can recall, that parallel runtime is. Um, the number of rounds times uh, the uh, number of um, uh, uh, iterations per round. And um, the way to read these plots is that um, each um, uh, point is a separate fully run experiment um, for some number of rounds of communication. So um, on the left-hand side of this uh, left-hand plot, um, each uh, experiment is um, uh, the, um, the final uh, uh, log relative uh, suboptimality achieved uh, for each of these methods where um, the uh, number where there were five rounds of communication and um, where because the parallel runtime is 100 so that means you know of course uh, 20 um, uh, iterations per. And um, as we go to the right of each plot, um, we uh, increase the number of um, rounds of communication, and um, maybe not quite so surprisingly, the best uh, suboptimality uh, is able to improve, right? Because the idea being that, um, you know, in the case that communication is uh, expensive, um, we might not want to uh, communicate as often. And um, so, um, the left-hand plot is for 100 machines, the right-hand plot is for 200 machines, and, and um, especially in the right-hand plot, it becomes even more um, evident how our, um, particularly in the uh, um, uh, uh, regime of low communication, our method uh, shows empirical um, improvement over um, related methods, uh, um, such as local SGD, mini-batch SGD, um, and um, FedAC. And, um, and these are some of them <clears throat> with and without uh, some momentum. So in terms of uh, open problems, um, I mentioned, you know, we, we were trying to compare against the lower bounds that we showed in the case of stochastic gradient oracle access, but what about, um, you know, would it be possible to show lower bounds um, with respect to this, um, uh, additional oracle access in terms of this stochastic hash image product. Um, and it would sort of complement what we know under this gradient oracle access. And, and furthermore, you know, these, uh, what we have for the first order might provide uh, a nice starting point for um, understanding. Um, in addition, um, I, um, we, in our method, we only use an unaccelerated variant of local SGD 
as the main parallel solver for quadratics. And this was mainly due to technical difficulties that um, cropped up when trying to um, analyze an accelerated variant, at least uh, out of the box. And much of that came from um, the dependence on the norm of V in the variance of um, the uh, Hessian vector product. Um, so uh, being able to use an accelerated method such as local ACSA or maybe some variants uh, of it as the main parallel solver for quadratics um, would be another interesting uh, uh, direction to explore and um, might even um, ideally that would uh, lead to um, uh, some further improvements in a, a vein similar to how uh, FEDAC, uh, the, the accelerated um, federated methods, uh, was able to improve upon local SGD. And um, finally, um, we should note that um, local SGD and FEDAC um, are sort of, they've been analyzed under the third order uh, smoothness condition. So that is a Lipschitz, condi uh, Lipschitz continuous Hessian. But they haven't been, um, uh, to my knowledge, have not been analyzed under a QSC condition. And so it might be interesting to see um, if these sorts of rates can sort of be achieved by local SGD or FEDAC. And one of the tricky things I feel like uh, there is that um, when you assume uh, quasi self concordance, it leads to this uh, natural um, breakdown of the problem into these. Um, uh, constrained quadratic problems and um, trying to sort of take one of these methods and apply it directly under the QSC condition um, might uh, pose its own, uh, its own set of challenges. So to conclude, um, in this talk, um, we've discussed a distributed stochastic Newton method um, for optimizing quasi self recorded objectives. And um, the, the key insight of the paper is um, how we leverage efficient parallel methods for quadratic problems. Um, our method improves upon existing stochastic methods and some parameter regimes, and all the while it is able to maintain a similar computational cost. And um, for, furthermore, it's, um, we've seen uh, how it can uh, um, perform um, uh, promising uh, empirically. Um, and we, especially in the uh, regime of uh, low communication. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for your great talk. So yeah, we still have some time. So please, if you have any questions or comments, just, just raise your hand and I'll try to unmute you. So let me start with a quick question. Mm -hmm. So all, all this work was for the homogeneous setting. So yes. do, do you see, yeah, do you see the way to extend this to heterogeneous setting and would like the same methods could be applied and, and maybe to some like meaningful maybe superior results there? That's uh, an excellent question. I have not thought much about the heterogeneous uh, setting. Um, I think that um, it would definitely be an interesting direction to explore. I suspect that it will have its own um, set of difficulties just because you know, no longer are you able to sort of have the, 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 the same quadratic models as you can in the homogeneous setting, right? So somehow like having these, these, these different models um, uh, might complicate how you combine them and how you, you run some of the technical details, but certainly it would be worth, worth exploring. But I have not thought uh, carefully about that. Thank you. Now we have uh, one question from audience. Let me try to unmute. Yeah, so please go ahead. Uh, 
I, I can't hear the question so well. I apologize. So maybe just please type a question to chat and I can read it loud for you. Can you hear me? Excuse me. Yes, now we can hear you. Now we can hear oh, you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much for the talk. Um, can you please, uh, so as I understand, uh, this generalization of soft importance is why in uh, that we allow some like arbitrarily power, not three divided by two, but some general power. Can you highlight how it is coming to analysis? Ah, yes. Um, and, and I will note that um, there, th so there is a, a notion of generalized self accordance which has some power between like a one and a three halves. Uh, yeah, yeah, between a one and a three halves. And, and QSC uh, uh, is specifically where that power is, is the one. Um, what's um, basically what happens is um, when you have, I can actually go back to that slide. When you have um, this uh, quite self accordance uh, condition, um, what you're able to say is that um, for uh, it, it induces some, some, some sort of local stability. So, specifically, what that says is that if you are at um, a, a point uh, X and um, you um, look at all of the points of um, uh, in some ball of radius r around um, that um, point, where the radius depends on the quasi self coordinates parameter. Okay, it's it's roughly like um, uh, one uh, uh, divided by it. Um, then for all points in that ball, um, the um, Hessian of the points in that ball is basically like a constant approximation of the Hessian at X. So that's the key thing. Um, uh, that, that the Hessian in a small ball around the point, the Hessian doesn't change too much. And when the Hessian doesn't change too, too much compared to the starting Hessian, right? Um, then that problem looks almost quadratic, right? And uh, you can then go from almost quadratic to actually constrain quadratics by just a little bit, a little bit more work. But that's that's the key idea. Does that kind of make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you also comment about this uh, quasi self concordant uh, assumption? So, uh, just classical self concordance is a fine invariant with respect to change of the variables x, and uh, quasi self concordance uh, doesn't have such property. True. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. I see. Uh, also, can you please comment about this assumption? So, uh, so this uh, third derivative is horrible through linear form. Uh, and what does it mean u, u, and h in the left-hand side of inequality? Ah, so that is um, to uh, break the symmetry because note that um, the, because, so in normal self-concordance, you, you could sort of define it with respect to the same U and all three components, right? But now, because we have a separation between a norm term on the H and sort of a Hessian norm term in terms of the U, right? We need to be able to separate the two. So we, we consider um, a difference between a U and an H. We break the symmetry between the U and the H. Okay, thank you. Okay, then there's a new question in the chat. Oh, yeah. Okay, so just a comment by Van Howard that he would ask the same questions as I did. Uh, yeah, so please. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and uh, I would note that, um, of course, in, in our paper, we uh, uh, explain and, and describe um, QSC and how it, it works in, in our, uh, or how it fits into our work, but um, also the re uh, re relevant past works. Actually, they're the ones listed on this slide. Um, I would highly recommend um, pointing to as well, as they are both um, excellent works um, that find, um, that, that, that show 
um, how QST sort of can be used. Oh, and also this is based on, I should mention, some much earlier work from the early 2000s by Buck. Uh, it's the paper is called something like uh, self-important analysis of logistic regression. Um, all of these works are you know, fantastic and um, show interesting connections between acceleration and Newton's method and this QSC stuff and trust region. So I, I highly recommend uh, checking them out. I guess we still have some time to ask one or two last questions. So, so please, if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll try to unmute you. Even if you have a comment, so please go ahead. Okay, so it seems that there are no other questions. Thank you, Brian, again, for your excellent talk. And thanks, thanks to everybody for showing up today. So we continue next week. We have Sebastian Stick speaking about new methods for more effective bi bidirectional compression for failure to learning. And I hope to see you all next week. So thank you again, Brian, and see you all. Thank you. Thank you.